Joining me right now for some perspective on the numbers, we have Dr. Rewat Dianandan joining us once again. He's an epidemiologist and science communicator at the University of Ottawa. Hi, doctor. Hi, how are you? Good. Did you have a nice weekend? I did. Yeah. I'm calling it June-tober. It was a little bit cool <laughs> over the weekend. It certainly was. Yeah, that's Ottawa life for you. Don't you love it that the province goes, hey, Ottawa, phase two, you can go sit on a patio, and Mother Nature said, mm, 12 degrees, here you go. It's natural pandemic control. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, so what do you think of the local numbers that we're seeing lately? Well, it's good, obviously. Um, everywhere in Ontario is trending in the right direction, except for a handful of places, Toronto, Peel, York, and Windsor. Um, but in general, things are going the right way. Now, uh, we're starting to see the results of the demonstrations and protests uh, five or six days ago starting to manifest in the case counts. So I'm holding my breath to see how that uh, progresses the next couple of days. But if all goes well, we should continue to see a downward trend. What do you think about the fact that Toronto is still stuck in phase one? They've added a number of other regions to phase two today, but not Toronto, not Windsor, Essex, and not Peel. Well, that's the way it has to be, right? So Toronto, those areas you mentioned all have reproduction numbers above one. Mind you, Halton has a reproduction number of 1.27, I believe, and they're opening up. So this isn't all about the reproduction number, which is the number of new cases on average that an old case produces. We like to have that number below one. It's also about the uh, the incident rate, which is the number of new cases per day, and about the, the prevalence rate. So everywhere is looking good except for the regions that you mentioned. And so... Uh, Again, just hold our breath and make sure that those places come down in the next few days or weeks. There's nothing stopping the people in Toronto from going to Markham or Niagara. These places are very much within reach. The Premier was asked about it today, and he said, well, this is what we have to do. I'm listening to the Medical Officer of Health. Do you think that they should put some sort of advisory or guideline in place asking people, pleading with them not to leave the GTA? Yes, 100%. We're at the stage now in this epidemic where it's no longer in the hands of government or medical professionals or scientists that do the heavy lifting. Now it's the citizens have to do their part. And part of the price of living in a liberal democracy is that we are all responsible for each other. Freedom comes at a cost. And that cost is responsibility. So can we exercise that responsibility in a mature, reasonable fashion? I like to think that we can. I have my my skepticism, of course, but if we give the citizens all the information and proper guidance on what to do to keep everyone safe, I like to think that the majority will comply. Mm. Okay. I want to ask you about Beijing because, well, we're celebrating good news here in Canada and Ontario. In Beijing, they've had to unfortunately reimpose lockdown measures after a new COVID-19 outbreak. Apparently, there were domestically transmitted cases at this big wholesale food market. And so as a result of that, they've had to bring back more temperature checks. There are areas that have kind of gone back into lockdown. And this is a city that had largely returned to normal life. They had restaurants and shops open. They had daily rush hour traffic resuming. What do you take away from that? We take away from that that uh, we aren't out of this until a vaccine is available. We cannot let our guard down, and this is a real thing. There are still some people who believe that the epidemic is over. It's not over. It's just in recession or remission, and it will come back with a vengeance if a couple of cases ignite into outbreaks. So we have to invest heavily in these public health adventures and these public health infrastructural uh, uh, tools like contact tracing and testing, mask wearing and individual responsibility such that we can avoid that kind of scenario. Now, Beijing is an enormous city. Um, Ottawa yes. is not that big. Yes, so I mean, I should are... say this is an area that has 2 million people, this district in it. Right. So we're not at as risk as, as they are. But um, the signature of this disease is that it just loves mass gatherings. So a new paper I saw suggested that 80% of all transmission is caused by 20% of cases, and those cases tend to be these mass gatherings like churches or schools or bars. So if we can limit people's uh, exposure to situations like that, we have a good chance of avoiding the Beijing scenario. I was reading a journal the other day where they suggested that face shields could be the solution here. I know it sounds a little bit funny, but the author was saying that his face shield is so comfortable that often he'll leave work. He doesn't even really realize that he's walking home with his face shield on. And they presented a number of reasons. They said, one, 
they're lightweight. You're not fiddling with them as much because they're more comfortable. So therefore, you're not touching your face. It protects your eyes as well as your nose and mouth. They're transparent, so they're easier to communicate with. Your voice isn't muffled. And if somebody has a respiratory illness, like let's say asthma or COPD, it's easier for them to breathe. Um, so I, I'm wondering from your perspective, do you think that we could end up seeing people wearing face shields instead of masks? It's an interesting idea. It would be great for riding a bicycle in the rain and uh, for keeping your, <laughs> make, your makeup from getting smudged. Uh, ah, great yes. Advantages here. Sure. So, uh, I never, and it's good as well for uh, hard of hearing people to be able to read lips. You know, these are yes. things you don't think about much. And it's not as claustrophobic as a mask. So there are a lot of pluses to a face shield. It may not be as chic or fashionable. But these are cultural changes that we can certainly look into tweaking. Um, I haven't thought about it before, to be honest. But now that you mention it, I think it's a pretty good idea. She was good enough. Well, whenever you see workers wearing them, I, I've never seen them at a grocery store. They seem to just be just wearing masks. But whenever I see workers at the LCBO wearing them, they look quite comfortable. So and easy to clean as well. Exactly, something to think about. Finally, I'm going to ask you my crystal ball gazing question because you know that the premier. Will certainly be asked, I would say sometime this week, about phase three. Everyone always wants to move on to the next phase. Oh, we're in phase two. When's phase three coming? What do you think? When, when do you oh, think boy. most people will be back in the workplace? Wow, that's a tough one. Now, I it comes down to what, what index you're looking at. And I like the reproduction number. And I like to see the entire province below 0.5. I like to see the percentage of tests coming back positive being less than 1%. I like to see the number of new cases per day in single digits before that happens. And that will probably take us into August at the earliest before that happens, based upon my personal metrics. Now, is the province making decisions based upon those metrics? I doubt it, um, but we'll see what happens. But uh, I would say uh, if, uh, if I were making these decisions, um, I would suspect that um, the numbers would bend in our favor in late August. Dr. Ray Watt, Dan Anden, thank you so much for coming on the show once again. Thank you. Dr. Dean Anden, an epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa.